Hey everyone, welcome back to our channel. We are starting our Christmas story time with Kit and Margaret and Gracie and Amelia. They have their book there to read to you. It is called Kit Surprise. It's part of the Kit collection. It is her Christmas story. We're going to start on chapter one today. And chapter one is called Rick Rack. On a bright, brisk Saturday afternoon in December, Kit Kitridge and her best friend Ruthie were cheerfully skittering down the sidewalk together like blown leaves. They were going to the movies, which they loved to do. When the girls were close to the movie theater, Kit leaned forward. She put her fists in her pockets and pushed down so that the front of her coat covered more of her dress. Hey, Kit, what are you, are you okay? asked Ruthie kindly. Does your stomach hurt or something? No, said Kit. I'm fine. Then how come you're all hunched over like that? Asked Ruthie. Because, said Kit, I don't want anyone to see the rickrack on my dress. Why not? Asked Ruthie. It's cute. Cute? Said Kit. I hate it. My mother sewed it over the crease that was left when she let the hem down. I think it looks horrible. Actually, Kit felt as if the rickrack were a big embarrassing sign that said to everyone, Look at this old outgoing dress I have to wear because I'm too poor to get a new one. But she did not explain that to Ruthie. Luckily, Ruthie was the kind of friend who was helpful even without explanations. Walk behind me, she said. I'll cover you up. Once we're inside the movie theater, it'll be dark and no one will see. Okay, said Scott said Kit. She scooched up behind Ruthie and the girls went into the theater. It was very warm inside. The air was buttery with the aroma of hot popcorn. And of course, Ruthie was right. It was dark. Even so, when Kit sat down, she spread her coat over her lap to hide the rickrack. Want some? asked Ruthie, generously holding out her popcorn to Kit. Thanks, said Kit. She took just two pieces of popcorn so that Ruthie wouldn't think she was a moocher. She already felt prickles of guilt because Ruthie had paid for her movie ticket. Kit's father had lost his job five months ago because of the depression. Her family didn't have money to spare for luxuries like new dresses or movie tickets. Kit didn't see how she'd ever be able to pay Ruthie back. Not that Ruthie expected her to. It just made Kit feel funny to owe money, even to her best friend. Kit squirmed in her seat. It never used to be awkward like this before Dad lost his job. Back then, Kit could pay her fair share. Maybe she shouldn't have agreed today with Ruthie, whose father still had his job at the bank, insisted on paying for her ticket. Think of it as an early Christmas present, said Ruthie. Maybe I shouldn't have given in, thought Kit. But as soon as the newsreel began, Kit was very glad she had given in, because there on the screen, smiling and waving at her, was Kit's absolute heroine, Amelia Earhart. Kit sat on the edge of her seat. The newsreel narrator was saying that Amelia Earhart was the first woman in history to fly a plane across the Atlantic Ocean all by herself. Kit knew everything about the daring solo flight. In fact, Kit had a newspaper article about it tacked to her wall, above her desk at home. She read it a million times and stared at the photo of Amelia Earhart grinning, her cocky, confident grin. Now Kit stared at the movie screen as Amelia Earhart in a sporty jacket, flight cap, and gloves saluted the camera and climbed into the cockpit of her plane. Kit listened to the rumble of her plane's motor. She could almost feel the little plane straining to go faster, faster, faster as Amelia Earhart drove it down the runway. Then at last, you could feel the exhilaration of lifting up off the ground and soaring above the clouds. The newsreel ended and Kit sank back. But she was so carried away by Amelia Earhart that the cartoon after the newsreel went by her in a blur. When the feature movie began, Kit didn't even try to make sense of the story. It was about a silly woman with a tiara, singing and dancing her way up a staircase shaped like a wedding cake. When at last the movie was over, Kit walked out into the late afternoon sunshine, still thinking of Amelia Earhart. She ignored the rickrack on her skirt hanging out below her old winter coat. 
Amelia Earhart wouldn't let a thing like that bother her. Ruthie didn't mention the rickrack either. She turned to Kit and said, Wasn't she wonderful? Yes, Kit agreed with enthusiasm. Thank you so much for bringing me today, Ruthie. I loved watching her climb into that plane and... Not Amelia Earhart, Ruthie laughed. I meant Dottie Drew, the movie star. Oh, her, said Kit. Wasn't she beautiful? <gasps> Breathed Ruthie, like a princess almost. Uh, sure, said Kit. Ruthie had a fascination for movie stars and princesses, which, quite frankly, Kit did not share. But she didn't want to be rude. Ruthie had paid for her ticket, after all. Kit might seem ungrateful if she said she thought the woman in the movie was silly. But Ruthie knew Kit too well to be fooled. She grinned. I bet you didn't even notice Dottie Drew at all, she said. I should have known you'd care more about Amelia Earhart. How come you're so crazy about her? She's smart, said Kit. She's brave, too. When she makes up her mind to do something, she doesn't let anything stop her. She flew her plane across the ocean all by herself. She didn't need help from anybody. Kit spoke with determination. I want to be like her. I know what you mean, said Ruthie. It's the same with me. I love to imagine that I'm a movie star or a princess. Kit didn't think her serious ambitions were the same as Ruthie's starry-eyed daydreams at all. That's different, Ruthie, she said. First off all, Amelia Earhart's a real person who does real things that really matter. Movie stars and princesses are only phony glitter and glamour, and I don't imagine that I am Amelia Earhart. I want to be like her. Imagining that you're a princess is just make-believe. So, shrugged Ruthie, there's nothing wrong with make-believe. Maybe not, said Kit. But imaginary stuff doesn't solve any problems or help anything. Oh, I think it does, said Ruthie. Make-believe can take your mind off your troubles for a while. That's a help. On the sidewalk ahead of the girls, Kit saw a sad sight. It was a pile of household goods dumped on the curb. A bed frame leaned against a chair, and a lamp lay sideways on the ground. Books, clothes, and pots and pans were jumbled together in a heap. Look, Kit said to Ruthie, pointing to the pile. That stuff belongs to a family that's been evicted. They've been thrown out of their house because they can't pay for it anymore. You've got to admit that make-believe and imagination are not going to help them. They should have imagined a way to get money, Ruthie said. They could have done something. I'm sure they tried, said Kit, thinking of how hard her family struggled to pay the bills every month. Maybe they just couldn't keep up. Then, said Ruthie, they should have asked their friends for help. Maybe they were too proud for that, said Kit. Ruthie shook her head sadly. And look where their pride got them. Thrown out in the street, she said. It won't be a very Merry Christmas for their family, will it? No, said Kit, it won't. She shivered. Come on, she said to Ruthie. Let's run till we warm up. Last one home is a rotten egg, said Ruthie. The girls ran the rest of the way to Kit's house. Kit's family had turned their home into a boarding house in order to earn some money after her dad lost his job. The boarders paid a weekly rent for their rooms and their meals. There were five boarders living in the house now. Miss Howard and her son strolling. Mr. Peck, Mrs. Hart, and Mrs. Finney. Mr. Kitridge and Kit's brother, Charlie, were fixing up another room so they could take in two more boarders as soon as possible. Kit was expected to do her share of the housework and to help with breakfast and dinner. So she quickly helped her mother scrub potatoes and put them in the oven before she and Ruthie went upstairs. The girls were engaged in a secret project with Mrs. Hart and Mrs. Finney, two young nurses who rented what used to be the guest room. Mrs. Hart and Mrs. Finney had helped the girls unravel old sweaters and then used the wool to knit scarves. The scarves were almost finished, except for the fringe. Kit and Ruthie planned to give their scarves to their fathers for Christmas. Mrs. Hart planned to give hers to her boyfriend. Mrs. Finney said she wasn't sure which lucky guy would get her scarf. She couldn't decide between Tarzan and Franklin Roosevelt, who had just been elected president. Any 
news from Mrs. Hart's boyfriend lately? Asked Ruthie as the girls walked down the hall. Yep, said Kit. He's coming to Cincinnati at Christmas time. Mrs. Hart's boyfriend lived in Boston and sent her long letters and fat envelopes nearly every day. Mrs. Hart wrote back just as often, and her letters were just as long. Kit and Ruthie were both curious about the letters, and Ruthie especially liked to keep an eye on the progress of Mrs. Hart's romance. Mrs. Hart must be thrilled, said Ruthie. Oh, if only they could have a romantic date while he's here. He'd probably ask her to marry him. Mrs. Hart's boyfriend is a student in medical school, said Kit. It'll take all his money to travel here. I don't think he'll have any left over for a fancy date. I wish he would, said Ruthie dreamily. Mrs. Finney and Mr. Peck could go too, and they'd fall in love. That's what would happen if they were in a movie. Well, said Kit crisply, they're not in a movie. They're in real life. Too bad, sighed Ruthie. Kit knocked on the door to Mrs. Hart and Mrs. Finney's room. There was no answer. I guess they're working the weekend shift at the hospital, Kit said. We won't be able to finish our scarves today. Want to go up to my room and make a newspaper instead? Sure, said Ruthie with enthusiasm. Both girls loved making newspapers, which they shared with the boarders. And Kit's family will write about Amelia Earhart, said Kit. And Dottie Drew, insisted Ruthie. Kit pretended to be puzzled. Who's she? she asked. Very funny, said Ruthie. Okay, said Kit, grinning. Her too. And she danced up the attic stairs to her room the way Dottie Drew had danced up the wedding cake in the movie. Ruthie leaned over Kit's shoulder. Kit was typing a paragraph. Ruthie had written about Dottie Drew. Wait a minute, Ruthie said. It's Dottie Drew, not Duty Draw. And she's a movie star, not a movie tar. You better fix those mistakes. I can't, sighed Kit. My typewriter keys are broken. The O looks like a U, and the E looks like an O, and the S doesn't work at all. Oh, well, that's okay, said Ruthie. She grinned, then said slowly, I mean, a wall, that you key. Kit grinned, too. I guess people will figure it out, she said. Anyway, the pictures are great. The girls had a smart idea of asking Sterling to draw sketches of Amelia Earhart and Dottie Drew to illustrate their newspaper. Sterling was the same age as the girls, but he could draw as well as a grown-up. Sterling's a good artist, said Ruthie, as she looked through the sketch pad. See how he made Amelia Earhart look like you, Kit, freckles and all. Kit nodded. And he put you in Dottie Drew's fancy ball gown and tiara, she said. That's me, Princess Ruthie, <laughs> giggled Ruthie, striking a princessly pose. Kit looked at the paper and her typewriter. There's still a little space left, she said. What should we write about? Christmas, said Ruthie. We can say Christmas is coming. Everyone loves to read about that. I personally can't wait. I love everything about Christmas. What's your favorite part, Kit? Christmas Eve, said Kit. That's when we put up our tree. Charlie's going to get us a free tree this year. We always decorate our tree on Christmas Eve. It looks so beautiful, especially with the lights. We turn them on when we finish decorating, and we have dinner next to the tree. Mother always makes waffles. It's our tradition. I love it. I love the tradition that you and I have, said Ruthie, when we go downtown with our mothers on the day after Christmas. Ruthie, Kit began. I'm sorry. I'm afraid. But Ruthie talked over it. I know you and your mother are awful busy this year, what with the boarding house and all, she said. So I was thinking that maybe this Christmas, instead of the whole day, we could go downtown just for a few hours instead. That'll be just as fun, wouldn't it? Kit believed in telling the truth, even when it was hard. Time isn't the only problem, Ruthie, she said. My mother and I don't have any money for lunch at a fancy restaurant or tickets to a show. We don't have money for presents, even. Not this year. That's what I figured, said Ruthie. So I thought we could change our tradition and just go window shopping and have a winter picnic or something. I think, said Kit slowly, it would wreck our tradition to change it. We wouldn't change at all, said Ruthie. We still get all dressed up in our best dresses and... 
I'd have to wear this rickrack dress Kit cut in, which I hate. She knew it sounded like a sourpuss, but she couldn't help it. But it's Christmas, Ruthie insisted. You never know what might happen. You might get a new dress. Kit shook her head. The last thing I want my family to do this Christmas is to spend money on me, she said. I don't want dresses or outings or presents. The only thing I want to is to find a way to make money. Find a wicked ogre, said Ruthie. Lots of times in fairy tales, a princess is kind to an ogre. And then he spins straw into gold for her, or he enchants her so the jewels come out of her mouth when she talks. Or he grants her three wishes. Kit felt annoyed at Ruthie and her princesses. She and her family were real people, not characters in a fairy tale. For Pete's sake, she said, it takes work, not wishes, to solve problems. That make-believe stuff is silly. There are no ogres in Cincinnati. Ruthie just grinned. Watch out, she said. If you're not nice, the ogre will make snakes and toads come out of your mouth. How'd you like that? Not much, said Kit impatiently. She pushed the silver arm that moved the paper up and out of the typewriter. But she pushed a little too hard, because to her horror, it came off in her hand. Oh no, she cried, holding the silver arm up for Ruthie to see. Look what I've done. Uh-oh, said Ruthie. Can you screw it back on? No, said Kit. Oh, now the typewriter won't work at all. Come on, said Ruthie, heading for the stairs. Let's go get your dad. I bet he can fix it. I sure hope so, said Kit. The girls hurried downstairs. They paused in the hallway outside the living room because they heard Kit's parents talking to someone. The conversation sounded serious, so they knew they shouldn't barge in and interrupt. Don't leave yourself enough to watch, Missy. Kit's dad was talking. The room should be ready in middle by the middle of January, he said. Then we can take two more boarders. I'm afraid that'll be too late, said the other voice. The girls looked up at each other in surprise. It was Ruthie's dad, Mr. Smitten's, speaking. Ruthie stared, started to go into the room, but Kit held her back. I've come today as a friend, Mr. Smitten said. Your name is on a list of people who owe money to the bank. People were behind on their mortgage payments. I came to warn you that if you can't catch up your payments, the bank will take your house and you'll be evicted. Evicted, Kit felt as if she'd been hit hard in the stomach. I'll hold off the bank until after the holidays, Ruthie's dad said. But if you can borrow the money from someone, you should. Do you think your aunt in Kentucky might help, Jack? Or Margaret? How about your uncle here in Cincinnati? Kit's mother stared, started to answer, saying, Well, I... Thanks, Stan, Kit's dad interrupted. We'll figure something out. Kit could barely breathe. Evicted. She and her family were going to be thrown out of their house. All of their belongings would be tossed out onto the sidewalk, just like those she and Ruthie had seen on their way home from the movies. It's going to happen to my family, she thought. It's going to happen to me. She shuddered, and Ruthie touched her arm. Oh, Kit, Ruthie whispered. What'll you do? I wish. Wish, thought Kit. She jerked her arm away. She couldn't bear to hear Ruthie say one of her silly things about wishes and princesses and make-believe. Not now. It was bad enough that Ruthie had been there to overhear the terrible, humiliating news. Without a word, Kit turned sharply and went back up the stairs to her room, leaving Ruthie all alone in the hall. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed Chapter 1 of Kit's Surprise. As I stated, I'm going to go ahead and read the whole book. And so stay tuned, and we'll have Chapter 2 tomorrow. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening, great day. Thank you for all your support. We love you. We hope you're enjoying your holiday season and we'll see you on the flip side. Bye all.